This is Independence, Missouri. Population, 45,000. Rubbing elbows with a big hub to the west, Kansas City. Independence hasn't lost its Middle West flavor, old enough to have pride, small enough to be sentimental. It is close to the land and to the people, and like all who depend upon the soil, keenly aware of the unpredictable hand of providence. Perhaps the town has fully earned the right to be called Independence, now that it can boast a direct link with the fight for freedom. Independence. No word with finer meaning is woven into the American heritage. The pages of our history are filled with voices that cry out for freedom. For freedom and independence are two sides of the same coin. We Americans have answered those voices at Lexington and Valley Forge and Fort Sumter and in the shadows of the Argonne. And we answered them in our own times at Salerno on the tragic flats of Iwo Jima on a cold, bleak hill called Heartbreak Ridge. As to everyone, these names are important to folks in independence. They will tell you, if you drop your guard for an instant, how it happened that some years ago, they sent one of their sons to Washington, a man whose words were the straight talk of the inland America. And how, like a story that happens only once in the age of a century, he became overnight a man of destiny. This is Harry S. Truman, private citizen, incurable pedestrian, a man of the people. Someone has written of him, there are moments when his innate dignity and simplicity are reminiscent of Lincoln. His faith has depth. His belief in God is implicit. These traits, plus an enormous energy, served him well in the spring of 1945, when Harry Truman kept his appointment with fate. 7.09 p.m., April 12, 1945, taking the oath of office as President of the United States before Chief Justice Stone. Hitler the Antichrist, unaware that his dream of empire was only 25 days away from disaster, for the Nazi machine was beginning to feel the might of allied armies. On the English shore stood a tower of strength, Winston Churchill. The power of his words gave comfort to a people who had reason to feel little or none of it. We cannot yet see how deliverance will come or when it will come, but nothing is more certain than that every trace of Hitler's footsteps, every stain of his infected and corroding fingers will be sponged and purged and if need be, blasted from the surface of the earth. Four days after the oath, President Truman makes his first appearance before Congress. No greater burden was ever placed on the shoulders of a single man. On that day, he felt the sudden, shattering impact of absolute reality. Tragic fate has thrust upon us grave responsibility. We must carry on. I ask only to be a good and faithful servant of my Lord and my people. The historic conference at Potsdam. In the offing, international accord. Churchill, Truman, and Stalin take up political and economic questions on the heels of German capitulation. The underlying goal of the meeting, in President Truman's own words, we can never permit any aggressor in the future to be clever enough to divide us or strong enough to defeat us. Historians who search the documents of those months will observe the common pattern of unity and strength running through the two big conferences in that period, Potsdam and San Francisco.
President Truman before the closing session of the United Nations Conference in San Francisco. He tells the delegates, if we had the United Nations Charter a few years ago, and above all, the will to use it, millions now dead would be alive. If we should falter in the future in our will to use it, millions now living will surely die. The gravest decision of our time was made in the summer of 1945. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. Three months and two days after the defeat of Germany, President Truman announced to the civilized world the surrender of Japan. A fateful day on the deck of the battleship Missouri, anchored in Tokyo Harbor. General MacArthur and Japanese Imperial General Headquarters representatives signed the instrument of unconditional surrender. President Truman summed up the nation's feelings. Behind this surrender are the will and spirit and determination of a free people who know what freedom is and who know that it is worth whatever price they had to pay to preserve it. In the summer of 1950, communist forces attacked the Republic of Korea. On June 25th, 1950, one year ago today, the communist rulers resorted to an outright war. They sent communist armies on a mission of conquest against a small and peaceful country. That act struck at the very life of the United Nations. It struck at all our hopes for peace. There was only one thing to do in that situation, and we did it. If we had given in, if we'd let the Republic of Korea go under, no nation in the world would have felt safe. The whole idea of a world organization for peace would have melted away. The spirit of resistance would have been broken and the free nations would have been open to conquest one by one. We did not let that happen. We remembered Japan and Manchuria, Italy and Ethiopia, and Hitler in the Saar Basin. For the first time in history, a world organization of nations took collective military action to halt aggression. And acting together, we halted it to avoid like the plague race actions which would take unnecessary risks of world war or weak actions which would reward aggression. We must be firm and consistent and level-headed. If we get discouraged or impatient, we can lose everything we're working for. If we carry on with faith and courage, we can succeed. And if we succeed, we will have marked one of the most important turning points in the history of man. We will have established a firm peace for the whole world to last for years to come. That is a goal to challenge the best that is in us. Let us move toward it resolutely, with faith in God and with confidence in ourselves. Back home with Mrs. Truman and daughter Margaret. One thought is uppermost in Mr. Truman's mind the task of organizing the great mass of presidential papers before turning them over to government custody in the future Truman Library. In Kansas City, Missouri, the store of Truman documents await their permanent home. In these temporary quarters, archivists document and identify thousands of papers that passed over the presidential desk. Evidence of, hi of historic events. They belong to every American because they express the purpose ideal and spirit of a free people. Milestones of freedom, proof in black and white that the spirit which fights against enslavement is still strong on the face of the earth. This and thousands of other documents like it will provide valuable detail and source material for the history books of tomorrow. 
for the Truman administration, no less than that of Jefferson or Lincoln, has shaped the course of human affairs and the thoughts of the people. The Nazi dream of world domination crumbled to ruin. The Allied powers have wrung from Germany a final and unconditional surrender. Here, too, students and scholars will have a chance to ascertain for themselves how difficult it is to win the victory and maintain the peace. Emperor Hirohito commands his people forthwith to cease hostilities and to lay down their arms, a document for the freedom trains of tomorrow. This is the challenge. Those who support the Truman Library program help make democracy a living influence. There is no room in America for educational isolationism. If education is the road to freedom, that road itself must be free. The Constitution of Puerto Rico, bringing to that island community the rich heritage of the American hemisphere. Here is sanctuary for presidential papers. Within the shade of elm, oak, and maple, on a gentle knoll, soon will rise the Truman Library. With Mayor Weatherford of Independence and friend Tom Evans, Mr. Truman goes over the building plans with architect Lon Gentry. Here will be a practical laboratory of militant democracy, enabling students and scholars to consult its valuable detail and historians to revel in a treasure of source material. For who will say that Potsdam is not now entitled to have a place on the shelf next to Tom Paine's The Crisis of 1776? or Mr. Wilson's League of Nations Covenant of 1918. In the backward glance of history, the Truman Doctrine joins company with Thomas Jefferson's Bill for Religious Freedom, and the United Nations Charter shares honors with the Mayflower Compact. It was my fate, due to the will of an all-wise providence, to become president of the United States during a most crucial time. Just before the surrender of Germany at the end of World War II and a short time before the surrender of Japan. It was my duty to make some earth-shaking decisions, both for the welfare of the United States and for the welfare of the world. This library, which we are discussing, will be situated in Independence, Missouri, and will contain the documents which were accumulated during the eight years that I was president of the United States. There will be the Charter of the United Nations with the original signatures on it. There will be the re records of the Potsdam Conference and several other great conferences which took place while I was president. This will bring an immense number of people here who are interested in the history and the education of the, United, of the people of the United States. It's a great thing for this community. It'll belong to the government. It'll be in charge of the archives. I'll have nothing to do with it except that my office will be there as long as I live to explain things to the people who do not understand what the documents mean. This then, Harry Truman, is the nation's remembrance of your acts in office. A circle of spacious stone buildings, place of lasting joy to scholar and researcher who seek the ever fathomless mystery of the miracle that is America. Yes, the independence story is true and its enthusiasm is honest. For the facts are all written in the records, waiting for the historians to tell us what perhaps we already know, that his was the most critical tenure in American's history. You can tell how sentimental folks in independence are about all of this. And before many months, they will break ground and at their side, smiling happily, will be the man from independence who became president of the United States and helped shape human history for a thousand years to come.